The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Jesus came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about, then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Got a future preacher here. It's probably smarter to listen to her than to me, so that's good. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I like these texts is because it's very practical. I like practical things. I like to discuss, like, theories and, you know, stuff like that. But in the end... I want to know why it matters. Exactly. So what, she said. Why does it matter? Why are we talking about this, listening to this, reading this? What does any of this actually mean? Was the question that my father would always tell me that he would share with other seminarians, other students when it came to preaching. Okay, you told me about it, but so what? Why does it matter to me? When you talk to people about different gifts and abilities and different opportunities in order to share their faith, evangelize, scary word, I know, talk to others, invite people, people are often say, well, that's pretty much the one thing I don't want to do here as part of the church. We're scared. We're worried. We don't feel prepared. We're not quite sure what to do. What if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? What do I do then? Exactly. Exactly. What do I do? I'm not sure. Well, when I'm talking with people about that, usually I just say, well, the first thing you do is say, you know what? I don't know. Because that shows you're human, right? It shows that you're not perfect, even though you might be. It shows that you don't know everything and that you don't have to know everything. That we can say, I'm not sure, and you know what? That's a great question, and we will look into that together, or I will ask somebody and see if I can find out for next time. But then there's another fear that comes up sometimes, and that is, what if they don't like me? (laughs) What if they say something mean or slam a door in my face or whatever? And what I think is so great about these texts today is that it's telling us that, well, yeah, it's going to happen. It might happen. It happened to the disciples, the apostles. 
Jesus told them not everybody is going to want to listen. So don't expect it to all be perfect all the time. And my favorite thing, Jesus says, just knock that dust off your feet and move on. Sometimes it's not going to go the way we want. Sometimes people aren't going to want to hear it. Sometimes they're going to be mean or rude. And that's fine. You do what you can. You knock the dust off your feet. Say, you know what? I'm not even going to take your dirt with me from this place. I'm going to leave it here for you. And you move on to the next place. Now, it's been a couple weeks since I made a baseball reference, so we're going to do that. Sports ball. Right, Darby? Yeah. <laughs> One of the hardest things to do in baseball and in any sport is to hit. You take a little round ball with a round stick, and you try to hit it squarely. Figure that out. Coming at whatever speed it might be, whatever trajectory or angle, whatever spin may be on it, and you try to hit it the best you can. The best hitters of all time hit the ball and get a hit how many times out of 10? What? <laughs> not the best hitter, no. Me, maybe, but not me. Yeah. What, Jacob? Three? Four? How many times? Five? No. Whoa! That'd be incredible. Jacob, how many times did anybody end up with an average over 400? One time. In the history of Major League Baseball, professional baseball, one person, one time, got a hit four out of ten times. You go to the Hall of Fame if you get a hit three out of ten times. So that means you go to the Hall of Fame if you fail 70% of the time. There are not many sports. There are not many jobs. There's not many anything that if you fail seven out of ten times, you're considered one of the best to ever do that thing. They teach us baseball is a game of failure. You're going to fail. The best people fail seven out of ten times. It's a game of failure. And so you have to learn how do you deal with failure. You can let it eat away at you. You can let it tear you down. You can let it destroy all your confidence. Or you can put it back into work. And recognize, hey, if I get a hit, three out of ten, I'm doing pretty good. So I got to knock that dust off my feet, the dirt from the batter's box, and move on to the next thing. I can't let it destroy me or eat away at me or make me feel lesser than who I am as a child of God. Yes, Jesus calls his disciples to go out two by two. This is not something we always just do on our own, right? Things are always easier with a partner. It's always easier to put yourself out there when you have someone else there to kind of back you up. And Jesus recognizes that. Jesus says, go together. What I think is also really cool is Jesus is saying, trust in God. That's not always easy. It's what we're told to do. It's not always easy to do. Because Jesus says, don't take anything with you. No money, no extra pair of clothes, no staff. Just go. Because more than likely, someone's going to welcome you and be kind to you. And if they don't, you just move on. Yes, our life of faith is one that has its ups and downs. There's going to be times we're feeling great. We feel like we got it figured out. 
We feel like, you know what, I got it, my faith is great, I believe, I trust, I'm moving forward. But then there's the times when, do I really believe this stuff? This doesn't make any sense. One plus one plus one equals one. Jesus is 100% human and 100% divine. How does any of that work? I'm not sure I can believe in this. Why are these things happening if God is so good? And that's okay. When people say, well, I was yelling at God, I kind of feel bad about that. I said, no, God can handle it. If God has shoulders, I'm sure they're pretty broad. God can handle when we struggle, when we doubt, when we're not quite sure what's going on. For anybody who says their faith is perfect and perfect all the time, then they don't have it figured out. Because nobody's faith is perfect. We're not perfect. And so we have to step out and say, you know what, sometimes I'm going to ask questions and that's a good thing because that's how we learn. The people who pretend that everything's perfect all the time I don't think they really understand how things work then. I don't think they're aware of what's happening around them, what things are going on in the world, how people are dividing each other and hating each other and telling others that they're not worth the same as them. It's not always easy. But the best part of all this is that we're not responsible for all of it. We don't have to fix everything because we can't. We're not the Savior. Jesus is. And so we are invited to go out and be part of God's work, to do the best we can, to share the good news, to invite people to learn more, to invite people to experience what God is already doing in their life, where God is already active around them and in them and through them. And sometimes it's going to be great, and sometimes it's not going to work out. But thankfully, we don't have to do it alone. We have each other, the community of faith. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us. All the different gifts and abilities and resources because together we are truly stronger in living into God's work in this world. Today we get to see a special moment, a moment that we celebrate God's covenant, God's holy promise with us that we are never left alone. As Sophia is baptized today, she is being claimed and named a child of God. She is part of the body of Christ, of all the baptized who have gone on before us, and all who are going to come after us. She's received the gift of the Holy Spirit. She's united with everyone in this place and around the world. And she's receiving God's promise that no matter what, nothing can separate her from the love of God because of what Jesus has done for us. It's a great moment for us, if we ourselves are already baptized, to remind ourselves of those promises that God has given us. It's a reminder of the promises that we make in return, of how we want to live our life in response to God's grace, in response to God's love. And I say response because it's not in order to earn, but it's because God has already given it to us. God's love is a gift. Our salvation is a gift. It's not something we have to earn, but something we get to respond to by sharing that hope with others. Because in the midst of all the turmoil, the hope that we have is in Christ. That Christ promises that we will one day be reunited with each other and that Christ will return and all things will be made new. 
sin and death and hatred and bigotry and racism and everything else will be wiped away. And we will all be surrounded by the love of God. The love that we get to see in action today as we baptize Sophia. So yes, I love these texts because, like I said, they're practical. It's just reality. Sometimes it's going to go great. Sometimes not so much. What does it mean to trust in God? What's it mean to struggle? Are we all perfect? No. But we do have the perfect love of God given to us because Jesus gave himself to defeat sin and death. So we'll see here in a minute. Try not to drop the baby. I've never dropped the baby. But I'm making Saray hold her this time, so. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible. <laughs> but we get to see this beautiful show of God's love. Nothing that Sophia has to do to earn it, but truly a gift to receive it. Being claimed, invited, and promise that no matter what, she's loved and that the Holy Spirit will be with her for all eternity. Amen.